Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to greet you as we meet to share together in this act of worship. It is a welcome to those of you who are visiting us, both here in the building itself and also further afield. Everyone is very welcome indeed. Our worship in the church this morning will include an act of communion, and I hope everyone who is in the building has access to the bread and the wine it is available to you. But also, if you're watching further afield and want to share in communion as the service unfolds, please have available to you bread and wine or what can represent that for you. We want everyone to feel included as we celebrate together in this act of worship. The prophet Isaiah calls us to worship with these words. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Let us pray together. Let us all pray. We are here to worship God, to give God the glory, for you are a great and glorious God. You who reign high above the heavens, mighty and majestic, we come to give you thanks and to offer you our praise, for we are humbled in your presence. For who are we that we might be in the presence of one such as you? Well, we rejoice. Because of what you have done for us in Jesus, we are your children. No longer need we be strangers to you, nor to one another. For we can indeed rejoice in knowing that we are all one in Christ. In and through him, we are in a relationship with you, established in love, molded by grace, fashioned by faith. And we can be assured that you will allow nothing to cause us to become estranged from you, such is the power of your love, the strength of your grace, the perseverance of your faith in us. We thank you too for the Holy Spirit, in and through whom this relationship is enabled to flourish, to develop and to mature, leading us aright that we might grow up to be your adult children. Inhabit our praise, we pray. Consecrate our worship and sanctify our service. And may all of us know ourselves to have been blessed by you. Amen. We're still not able to sing for ourselves. We still have to listen to others singing on our behalf. So we listen to the first of our hymns, To God Be the Glory.
Carol Carol is going to come and read for us a reading that's longer than our usual readings, but necessary for us to hear the whole story. A man born blind receives sight. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and came back able to see. The neighbours and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but is someone like him? He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The Pharisees investigated. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he'd received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But the others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who'd received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that, it, that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then he said to, them, to him, Then they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear again? Do you want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he come from, comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone who opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from good, he could, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sin and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Spiritual blindness. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. 
Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not, may, do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would not have sin. But now you, that you say, we see, your sin remains. Thanks be to God. I don't know what you thought when you were listening to that. Did you dare smile or even laugh? It's one of those passages in scripture that should make us laugh. It becomes almost farcical as the story unfolds. The man caught in the middle is the man born blind. He has the good fortune to be in a place where Jesus passes and as a result has the opportunity to have sight. Jesus heals him of his blindness. He's caught in the middle because soon afterwards he's forgotten, moved to one side, and the debate ensues concerning who is this Jesus? What right does he have to carry out such miracles? And you sense as you hear the story being read that bemusement in the man himself You've asked me once, I told you. You asked me a second time, I told you. You asked me a third time, I told you. The answer doesn't alter because you keep on asking me the same question. He spat, he made mud, he rubbed it on my eyes. Now I can see. I can't say any more than that. They even bring his parents along. Are you sure this is your son? Are you sure he was born blind? Now, if anyone would have known that he would have been born blind, it would have been his parents. And if anyone would have been able to recognize him for who he was, it would have been his parents. That's how desperate they were to try to find some way of disproving the fact that Jesus had healed this man. What began as a straightforward healing miracle soon moves to a discussion concerning how it was he became blind. The Jews had a belief that every cause and effect played on each other. So if something happened, something caused it to happen. This man was born blind, therefore something must have happened that he was born blind. Somebody sinned. Couldn't have been him because he was born blind. So it must have been his parents. And if it wasn't his parents, look back through the generations and sooner or later you will discover somebody who was a sinner sufficient that the effect of that sin rippled down through the generations and this man was born blind. Physical impairment must have been caused by behavior that deserved God's punishment and the punishment was the blindness of this young man. Jesus was at pains to debunk this argument. It was nobody's fault that the man had been born blind. It just happened that he was born blind. But we note in the story that Jesus was careful to say that such was his blindness, it could be used to good effect. A positive contribution to wider society, in Jesus' words, to glorify God. And while it's tangential to the main story, it's worth noting as we pass that those who, for whatever reason, find themselves impaired in any way, it's all too easy to write them off as having no contribution to make when everyone, regardless of their physical condition, has a contribution to make, and the church exists to facilitate the contributions of everyone, regardless. It was nobody's fault. 
It just happened. But of course, we like to be in that comfort zone of knowing that if something happens, there's a reason for it. It helps us to live life with a degree of confidence. We can predict what will happen. If X happens, Y will be a result. We like that. If everything was unpredictable, then life would be fairly anarchic and, well, we wouldn't do anything at all. So we like to have an explanation for what happens and why. Yes, there will be some things we can't explain for now. There may be some things that we will never be able to explain ever. We have to live with that. We have to live with the uncertainty that comes from knowing that some things happen beyond explanation. But then think about the Pharisees' response and apply it to ourselves, because if we're honest, we're a bit like them. There are times when we have an explanation for something, but it doesn't fit with our preconceptions, and so we refuse to accept it. We refuse to accept the evidence of our eyes because we're already programmed, hardwired to think in a particular way. And when something happens that moves us out of that comfort zone, we don't like it. So we think there must be another explanation. It can't be like this because that's not how the world is. We find it very difficult to accept an explanation that doesn't fit. We like to provide the answer, regardless of the question. And if the question doesn't fit our answer, we'll tweak the question rather than accept the answer. We will not accept the evidence of our eyes. There's an irony in this story. A man born blind who now can see, and those who see him as he is now, refusing to accept the evidence of their own eyes. But then fast forward to the end of the story and the encounter Jesus has with the man afterwards. And Jesus is seeming to say to the man, there will be times when the explanation you have for something will not be sufficient. You shouldn't be satisfied with just the mere explanation. Yes, it will be precise, correct and accurate, but perhaps it isn't the whole story. Having one question answered merely opens the door to the asking of an altogether deeper question. The man had been questioned by the Pharisees about who Jesus was. He says, I've no idea. He just came along. I suppose he must have been a prophet because he was able to heal me. But beyond that, I can't tell you anything else about him. But now when Jesus meets the man directly, he says to the man, we need to go further. So, would you recognize the Son of Man if he came in front of you? Would you recognize the Messiah? And the man says, well, show me the Messiah. And well, yes, I'll recognize him for who he is. And Jesus says to him, you've seen him. The fact that the blind man was given his sight by Jesus caused him to have to confront the question who is this Jesus who has done this for me when we see with our eyes what is happening around us both good and bad it should cause us to search for answers that go far deeper than the rhetoric of the day we need to probe far more earnestly than merely accept solutions that barely scratch the surface as far as resolving the big issues of life are concerned. If we're to do that, we needs must have opened for us the eyes of faith, because then and only then will we see clearly enough what we must do to be saved. There's a sense in which each of us comes here today to a degree blinded by the circumstances of life. We need to have Jesus come to us. We need him, as it were, to spit, to make mud, 
to rub it in our eyes and help us to see even more clearly than presently we do. We want to see Jesus, was the comment of some Greeks who came inquiring of Philip the disciple. It's a question we should always be asking. Sir, we would see Jesus. And now David is going to play for us as we move into our celebration of communion. And so we come to share in our act of communion. The words we use for the institution were given to us by the Apostle Paul. It's worth reminding us of the context in which those words were given. They are part of his first letter 
to the Corinthians, a letter which contained much teaching and some criticism of the way the Corinthian Christians were conducting themselves, not least of which around the time when they met together to share meals. They were good at sharing hospitality, but not in the way that they shared it. And he needed to remind them as to why they did what they did when they met together for a common meal. So he says to them, the significance of what we do is this, it comes from the Lord himself. This is not something we've made up for us, not something we've thought up to do as a good thing. It comes to us from the Lord himself. And it happened at a particular time, a time of great significance. It was on the night that he was betrayed that he took the bread and broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The significance of what we do is this. This is Jesus' own particular way of ensuring that we remember what is at the heart of the gospel. The fact that Jesus died on the cross, a broken body, and shed blood. So when we share together, have that sense about you that what we do is of profound significance. But then Paul adds his own rider, because the question that hangs in the air is, so what? Jesus shared it with his disciples. Why do we share it? And Paul says, well, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. What you are doing when you share this communion is not just among yourselves, for yourselves, within yourselves. It is a way of witnessing beyond yourselves to the fact that this Jesus who died continues to have great significance for the world of our day and generation. The phrase we often use, we keep alive the death of Jesus. So it's good this morning that the doors are open and we are witnessing to the world. We are showing forth the Lord's death until he comes in this simple act of eating and drinking together. I hope everyone has within arm's reach, as it were, some bread and some wine. So when it comes to it, we can easily and straightforwardly take of the elements. But before we do that, we offer our prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks for this bread and for this wine, that which is for us the broken body and the shed blood of our Lord Jesus. We thank you for the continuing significance of this shared act of worship in and through which we have called to mind Jesus' death on the cross, his giving of himself in love, his reaching out to the world in love, his embracing the world in love, his seeking to transform the world according to the love you have for each and all of us. We give you thanks that we can know what it is to be loved by you. Grant, O oh God, that as we share these elements together, that you, in and through the Holy Spirit, will encourage us to realize that we are loved with an everlasting love through Christ our Lord. Amen. So after giving thanks to God, he took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
do this in memory of me. And we share our communion in our usual way, so I invite you to take hold of a piece of bread and eat it at your convenience. And in so doing, be reminded that this is the body of Christ. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. And as is usual, we drink together. So I invite you to take hold of the cup, which is yours. And when we are all ready, we can indeed drink together. having shared together in this particular way David is going to play for us as we ask God to apply to our hearts the continuing significance of what we have shared
and we make our prayerful response. And in this stillness, we open our hearts to God. In silence, we cry out, dragging up from deep within us that which has otherwise lay dormant inside us, eating away at us, destroying us from within. Ignorance and selfishness, prejudice and indifference, willful blindness, that about us which needs to be forgiven that for which only God can forgive. Lord, hear my prayer. Yet we know that we cannot keep silent. There is that for which we cannot but cry out to God. Why? 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 We cannot understand We cannot make sense of what is happening around us in our world. We want so much for everything to be different. We want for everything to be made good, for justice to be our watchword, and for peace to reign. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. And now we listen to the second of our hymns.
Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal.